Hey guys, this is Trey. Welcome back to another 20 Minutes with Trey, and I'm excited to dig back into Genesis with you guys. This is a really cool one today, and um, we've got a really popular story, but we get to dig way into it. And so if you guys remember, last week we started a brand new series called the Torah series, and Torah is just a Hebrew word for law. And uh, in Hebrew, and, and the Jews use this word Torah for describing the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they were all written by Moses. So you may hear this called the book of Moses. Uh, you, you may hear this called the Pentateuch, um, or you may hear this called uh, the Torah. And so this is the Torah series where we're going to be walking through all five of those books and we're, we're not going to dig into every single verse, but I want to get a good, uh, good kind of a wide range of, of what these books look like, of how we're supposed to understand it, and specifically, how are we supposed to know what it means for our lives? How are we supposed to apply this to our lives? And so last week we talked about how the scripture, these scriptures want us to ask three things, three big major things about these stories. First of all, what does this story say about God? Because we, we, we found out last week that we know God through his story. In fact, we define God through the story that he has given to us. So what does the story say about God? What does the story say about man? And so when it says something about mankind in general, um, or even individual people, we know more about ourselves. And then thirdly, what does this say? What does the story say about our relationship man's relationship with God. And so we're going to do that. We're going to do three things today. And the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to read our 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 brand new uh, Genesis chapter three, our, our section here that we're going to go get dive into. We're going to read that. We're going to answer those three questions, God, man, and relationship. And then next, right after that, we're going to see God's response to this story. So we're going to read the story and then we're going to see God's big, awesome response to this story. And that changes everything. And then lastly, hopefully we'll have some time to follow the story a little bit uh, further down the road. And so let's dig right in. We're in Genesis chapter three. In fact, let me get, let me get there. Okay, let's, boom, here we go. Genesis chapter three. And here we go. Let's just read, I'm going to read verses one through about 13. So Hold on for uh, just a couple minutes while, while we read this. Now remember, God just created everything. He places man in the garden, and th this garden is, is flourishing, it's fruitful, and he puts man in the garden as his image and says, hey, have dominion and, and make it flourish even more. And so this is what happens when, uh, when the man and the woman are in the garden. Chapter 3 of Genesis. Now, the serpent, so here, here's a new character here, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and, and made themselves loincloths. All right, so they just sinned against God, okay? And, and they realize their shame, and they make loincloths, and let's see what happens next. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, 
The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so we're going to stop right there for a moment. Let's just talk about this. Let's let's answer these three things, God, man, and relationship, based on what this story is saying. Okay, so you have man and woman in the garden, Adam and Eve, right? They, they sin against God by completely breaking the, the one command that they have from him. It, this is in conjunction with the serpent coming and tempting tempting them to do this thing, okay? And then God comes, he says, hey, um, he seeks them out. He says, hey, what are you doing? And he said, I'm hiding. Adam says, I'm hiding because I'm afraid of you. I'm naked and I'm ashamed. And God's like, what? What? Uh, who told you you were naked? And and then the whole thing with the the, the blame shifting, like okay, um, I yeah I did this, but but you're you, actually the the woman that you gave me, she did this. And then the woman's like, I, actually that the serpent did this. So this whole blame shifting thing. So let's talk about first. Let's talk about man. What what, what does this story say about man? Um, it doesn't matter what you know which one we answer first. Let's just try to answer all of them. So. Let's go back up to, to the top. I want you to see something here. Verse, uh, verse 6. So the woman saw that, that line right there. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Do you notice something here that, that kind of rings a bell from last week? The woman saw that the tree was good. She saw that the tree was good. Last week, who saw what was good? God, and every day he created light and darkness and he, he looked and he saw and it was good. He said it was good. And then he, he created, he, he created the, the, the waters and part of the waters and he looked and he saw and it was good. So you have two contrasting seeing the goodness here. You have God seeing the goodness and man seeing the goodness. Uh, these are in complete contrast with, with each other to show us that when we seek good and when we decide for ourselves what is good, the seeing part, right? When we decide that apart from God and his commands and what he has made and designed, then that is sin. And not only that, but it actually backfires on us. It's not good, all right? The, the second thing that we see from this good stuff as you've probably heard this this your your entire life, how did the serpent, how did the serpent um, tempt Eve and Adam? Actually, who's, who's right there with her, by the way. He says this: um, For God knows that when you eat of it of this tree, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There's the good again, good and evil. What's the problem with that? They already have the good. They already know what's good. God has given them the good. All they have to do is trust God for what is good. Because they already have it. Why would you want to add on to that knowing deeply in yourself what is evil because you're the one that's evil? What? That's not good at all. That totally backfired on them. Um, they didn't learn any more good. They already had the good. They only needed to trust God for that. Um, so let, let's write a couple things down here. We, what we know about man is that man has fallen into sin. We have both Adam and Eve there have sinned because Adam is right there in the garden with her. He just stands by idle and, and doesn't say a word till she says, hey, you want this too? And he's like, yeah, totally, and, and gives in. So he is right there. He could have stopped the whole thing. So man has fallen into sin. Also, we doubt God's goodness. We doubt his goodness. We doubt that he knows what's best for us. We doubt his love for us. Uh, we doubt his authority. We actually rail against his authority to call the shots. Um, man, um, what else is there? Oh, yeah, the shift. We Sorry, let me do this. We shift the blame to other people. We try to 
in our minds, we try to think that we're all good and everyone else around us is not. Or we even sometimes try to accuse God, which is what Adam did. He says, hey, you gave me this lady. I, I, I don't know why, why she's doing this. And then and then Eve's tried to shift the blame to the serpent. So so when we do sin, our our first intention is to shift the blame away from ourselves and say, no, we didn't actually sin. It wasn't our fault, right? Um, anything else from here? Ah, okay, sorry. Um, one more thing. We are tempted by beings outside ourselves. That's that's another good thing that we can get out of this. This didn't just happen alone with just the man and the woman in the garden. They were tempted by the serpent, who we find out later to be Satan himself. So with Satan and those who are in the spiritual realm with Satan, his demons, right? They actually really tempt us. And we'll see this all throughout the scriptures. They they have real authority to tempt us. And to, in a way, in a way, we give ourselves to to work together with them in order to sin and rebel against God. So it's not just a physical thing. It's a very spiritual warfare that we're living in. All right, so what else What else do we know, or what can this story say? What does this story say about God himself? Well, the first thing I want to point out, and this might sound kind of weird, but that not God is not a trickster. I say, what? Okay, yeah, God's not a trickster. Well, so what Satan is trying to say here is that God is tricking them into not giving them the good. He's trying to hold back the good from him. That's what that's what the serpent says, right? He's, he's like, like you're going to get so much good out of this, so much awesome things going to come out if you just rebel against what God said. That 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 was his kind of um, his kind of temptation there. Um, and so he thinks, or he's trying to convince them that God is tricking them and keeping from them the good, when in fact that's not him at all. Let, let's just, I want to stop right there and just ask, do, how do you view God? And I, I know that's a huge, that's a, a huge question, and we're actually trying to answer that right now, right? Where, as we go through every story, but when you think of God, you think of God as this big old grumpy man in the sky who just kind of wants to take away your joy and just give you a bunch of rules to follow and 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 kind of just doesn't want you to experience the good in life and that's why you got to follow all these rules because he's just kind of taking all the fun out of life by by giving you the rules well the very first thing that we see satan tempting adam and eve with is is that idea right there like like god actually doesn't want you to have any good thing you just need to rebel against him and then you'll have you'll have the good you'll you'll have what you really want what you really need that's what satan tempts us with guys god is not a, a grumpy old man in the sky he he's not someone who wants to keep from you what is good he wants to give you what is good and and what is really good that Adam and Eve had, we'll get to in the relationship part in just a second. So let's let's dig back into what does this story say about God? Well, God is a God of justice. He's a God of justice. He came to them to seek out justice whenever they sinned. And actually, later on in the passage, he ends up cursing the serpent cursing the woman, cursing the man, and cursing the land even. Uh, and, and so he brings upon them the justice, um, well, part of the justice that, that justice that they deserve, and we'll talk about that more in, in a second. But God is not a trickster. God is a God of justice. His commands are good and for our good. His commands are good, and his commands are for our good. Um, also, man, th this is a really cool thing that I don't know if I've ever noticed before. 
as soon as they sin and they're hiding from God in verse 8 what 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 happens do they go find God no they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden God comes to find them God seeks them out God is a God who seeks out his people to show them mercy and grace. He is a pursuing, he's a pursuing God. Man, I love this. God had every right to just take them out. In fact, God's command was, if you eat of the, this tree, you will surely die that day. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, okay, that means spiritual death. Since they didn't die, that means spiritual death. I disagree with that completely. I think that what he really means is that you will spiritually and physically die. And the only reason why they don't physically die at that moment, as soon as they take a bite, is because God had mercy on them. And so not only is God a God of justice, which is awesome in itself, but God is also a God of mercy, and he pursues them with his mercy. Man, I love this. That we're, We get so much out of this just by dwelling on this passage. Okay, and lastly, in the three things, what does this say about our relationship with God? Well, Speaking of God's mercy, our, our relationship is based on his mercy and goodness. We'll put grace, his mercy and grace. That's what is the basis now. So before in, in the garden, there was freedom. Uh, Adam and Eve were right with God. They were in right standing with God. They had nothing in between them and God. And so God didn't have to extend mercy or grace because they weren't sinful. They were right standing. God created them like that. There was a great freedom in the garden. Now, from here on out, because now men are under sin, we are sinful people. Now we must, sorry, now the relationship is based on mercy and grace and only mercy and grace. If God doesn't have mercy and grace on us, there is no relationship. Um, also, this says that we, as humans, have a tendency to run from God. We must recognize this in ourselves. There's an old, there's an old song out there. It says, "Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love." And I love that verse. That 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 line just gets me every time because th this is what the scripture says right here. It, it says it right here. That, that we have this tendency to run from God. As soon as they sinned, that's what they did. They ran, they hid, they were afraid, they were ashamed, they were shameful. Speaking of that, let's put that on man. We are covered in shame and guilt because of our sin. That is something that God has to deal with us in some way. How can we get rid of this shame? How can we get rid of this guilt? How can we no longer be afraid of God? That's, that's the problem. That's the problem of sin, the shame and the guilt. And, and not only that, but God has every right to take out his wrath on us, right? Okay, back to relationship. Sorry. <laughs> uh, is there anything else? So, um, okay, this is, this is the big thing. What did they lose because of sin? Man lost. What did they lose? Well, they eventually get kicked out of the garden. But that's not, that's really, I mean, that really doesn't matter compared to, compared to the big thing. Like, yeah, a garden and it's flourishing and like lots of good animals and lots of good uh, trees and, and fruit and, and, perfect living and, and you know nothing dies that's awesome those are really great things but what do those good and great things attest to 
They attest to God himself. They, they point themselves to the one that they have, God himself. And God now becomes the one that they had. They lost God. Now they no longer have that relationship with him. They no longer walk with him in the garden. Uh, they no longer have right standing with God. Um, they no longer have freedom to be with God. In fact, at any time that God wants to, God has the prerogative to just straight up kill them and take out his justice right then and there. Anytime. There's nothing holding him back except his own mercy. And so this needs to be fixed. That that relationship needs to be fixed. Our separation from God must be fixed. Man, that's, that's tough. That's tough because we think we just have this access, right? At, I, I'm talking apart from religion, um, a, apart from uh, what we know as Christians, what Jesus has done. Uh, I think humans just kind of naturally think that we've got this access to God, but we don't. We don't have God. We don't dwell with him. We don't, uh, we don't have that relationship with him. We don't know him. That, that needs to be fixed. That, need, that needs to change. Okay, so that was our part one. That was that was the that was the bulk of it. Now we're gonna quickly do um, the next two parts. And the first thing we're gonna see God's response to them. what what does God do? And it changes everything. What does God do when they sin? And verse, um, let's see here, verse sixteen. He speaks to the woman. He's actually he's cursing. He's cursing the woman. Now she's gonna be bearing pain and childbirth, right? Um, and, and your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. Um, but look what, just before that, when he's speaking to the serpent, look what he says about the woman, the woman and the serpent. He says in verse 15, this is chapter three, verse 15, write this down, memorize it. You'll see why. It says, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. So this word seed or offspring, um, keep that in your mind. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is huge. In fact, this is often called the Proto-Evangelion, or however you say that in, in, in the Greek, right? It is the first gospel, the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman will come head to head. And, and in the Hebrew, it, it's, it's a lot more obvious than this, but the, the seed of the serpent will, will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman and the seed of the woman will actually crush the serpent, will crush the serpent. This is the first gospel. This, this is God's promise of deliverance from sin and everything that just happened and all of the bad effects that we just talked about and how, how it affects our relationship with God, this will be taken care of and fixed and brought back to good and reconciled through the seed of the woman. So, offspring, seed, keep, those, keep that word or those words in your mind. And every time we see that now, what are we going to look for? We're going to look for, oh, is this is this the promised one? Is this the promised seed? Is this, is this the promised offspring? And in fact, as we, last part here, as we follow the story, um, they have, Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, right? So whenever Eve has Cain, she's like, oh, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is uh, the promised seed, the promised offspring that God has promised to break this curse. And, and we all know that story. Cain kills Abel and Cain is not the promised one. They end up having Seth and oh, maybe through Seth, maybe Seth is going to be the promised one. Well, he's not the promised one, but what they do, what the, what the writer does is he follows the line through Seth. So from here on out, we're going to follow this line looking for, expecting to see the offspring, the promised offspring. So so we follow Seth, 
all the way down through his bloodline, and who do we find? Well, we find good old Noah. And you know Noah. You know his story. We're, we're actually not going to dig into it. We only have so much time and, and you know so much time every every day and so many lessons that that we need to go through this so i'm not going to hit every big story um even though this is a really good one but you know noah and how things get just get so bad that noah uh, has to be saved and, and god has to come and save noah and he tells him how to do it he says build a big old boat i'm going to destroy the whole earth with a flood and he does that and he saves noah and his family this is the bloodline of Seth, remember. He saves Noah and his family through the water. Okay, so maybe the offspring is going to be some in this family, right? And God, God, once again, shows his mercy and his grace, and he comes and he saves them. Well, things keep getting worse and worse and worse. And we get to this place called Babel. And, and Babel is a place where, where all these guys try to come together and make a tower up to the heavens to kind of take the place of God to kind of put their name out there and, 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 and be against God and make them in the place of God. And so we have these two big things, and, and they're not just, uh, once again, these are not just stories to say, oh, yeah, that, that's great, you know, that, that happened, cool. But they're stories that reveal something about God and reveal something about us. So the very last thing I, I want to do is just talk about two verses, one verse from each of the stories, one verse from Noah and one verse from the story of the Tower of Babel, and we will close it out for the day. The first one is this, chapter 6, verse 5. It says this, and this is probably another one you want to memorize. <laughs> the Lord saw, this is right before, this is right before Noah um, goes in the ark and God destroys everything, right before everything. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Guys, this is really important. This is what I want you to see about this. This is not just a, a kind of a passing thing like, oh, these people were really, really bad. These people were really, really evil. But this is a blanket statement to cover all of humanity. This is what the scripture is teaching us about who we are as humans apart from any of the work of God, that every intention of our thoughts in our heart is only evil continually. So let's write that down. That's our last one. Every intention of the thoughts of our heart, of our hearts, are only evil continually. Man, that is tough to take in because we don't we don't believe that. I mean, we, we don't just naturally think, yeah, everything I do is bad. But the intention is. That's what the scripture tells us. Everything we do, because it's not done in faith, it's not done to glorify God, it is only evil and continually. That's what our hearts are. That's what sin has produced in us. This is how we need to, to understand our sin. And finally, this kind of goes hand in hand with it. Chapter 11, Tower of Babel, says this in verse 4. They come together and they're going to make this tower. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves right here. Let us make a name for ourselves. That is what sin is. Sin is glorifying ourselves over God. Glorifying ourselves over God. So they sought to make a name for themselves instead of making a name for God. Because remember, they're made in the image of God. They're supposed to reflect Him. Not, not, not point to ourselves, but point to Him. Everything we do, instead, they flipped out. They reversed it and said, okay, no, I get the glory. Man gets the glory. We're the most important here. And so our last question as, as, as we close out today is how do we understand our sin? We first asked, how do we understand God? He's not this angry old man in the sky, right? He, he, he does everything for the good of his people, right? Secondly, how do we understand our sin? 
Our sin, apart from any work of God, our sin is in us, and we are only continually evil. Every intention of our hearts are evil continually. This is the depth that we need to be saved from. This is the grace that needs to reach down and save us. This is how we must understand ourselves in order to understand God's grace for us. So dwell on God, on who he is in in Genesis chapter 3. Dwell on man and, and man in our sinful state and how much we need God to save us. And then understand our relationship, how it's based only on mercy. And if there's no mercy, no grace, we don't have God. We don't have a relationship. And know that we have actually lost out on the greatest thing we could ever have, God himself. This has to be fixed. It has to be changed. And God's going to do it. God has promised it in the offspring of the woman and we know that that offspring is jesus himself praise god praise god all right i'll see you guys next week uh, we'll be back in genesis we're gonna start talking about abraham genesis chapter 12 so see you guys